But what's really instructive about Silvercrest uh, is cash at beginning of period, cash at end of period, debt at beginning of period, debt at end of period. That's really proof that the operation is generating cash. That's important to see. What I want to see now is the reserve reconciliation. The reserve reconciliation between the feasibility study uh, and the mine plan was stark. It was truly ugly. Uh, what they said was that their model didn't have enough data to support what was in the reserve study. In the realm of investing, few sectors have garnered as much attention and intrigue as the mining industry. With its promise of untold riches buried beneath the Earth's surface, it has long captivated the imaginations of investors seeking lucrative opportunities. However, navigating the complexities of mining investments requires more than just a casual understanding of market trends. It demands a keen insight into the underlying dynamics shaping the sector. In a recent video, renowned investor Rick Rule delved deep into the intricacies of the mining industry, offering invaluable insights gleaned from decades of experience. From dissecting the challenges plaguing mining companies to uncovering the keys to successful investment strategies, Rule's expertise shines through as he guides viewers through the labyrinth of the mining sector. Rule wastes no time in addressing the elephant in the room, the persistent underperformance of mining stocks relative to the price of gold. He attributes this discrepancy to two primary factors, escalating production costs and a lackluster track record of value creation. Despite the upward trajectory of gold prices, mining companies have struggled to translate this into robust margins, with rising input costs outpacing the gains in gold prices. Moreover, Rule highlights a deeper issue afflicting the industry, the erosion of investor trust stemming from decades of disappointing returns. He points to the alarming paradox of diminishing free cash flow per share during a period of soaring gold prices, underscoring the need for mining companies to prioritize efficiency over mere growth. The path to restoring investor confidence, Rule contends, lies in a fundamental shift towards operational excellence and value creation. Before we continue to delve into this discussion, please subscribe to our channel and activate the bell icon for timely updates. The miners have disappointed for decades. The malaise in the share prices of the miners, particularly relative to the price of gold, has two explanations. The first is that despite the fact that the gold price has gone up, the costs of producing gold have gone up too. And so the margins that one would have expected with a higher gold price uh, have been more muted than one otherwise would have expected. Inputs like labor, cement, steel, and energy have all gone up faster than the gold price. So despite the fact that the gold price has gone up, uh, producer margins haven't gone up as much as one expected. But there's a deeper and more pernicious problem which is to say the track record of the mining companies for delivering value over the last 40 years. Uh, certain investors, myself included, remember very well the decade 2000 to 2010, where the gold price went from $250 an ounce to $1,900 an ounce. And the free cash flow per share on the Philadelphia Gold and Silver Stock Index declined. These clowns actually made less free cash at $1,900 gold than they had at $250 gold. And certain investors, myself included, have not forgotten that. It's worth noting that most of the managers who presided over that abysmal performance were thanked and excused by shareholders allowed to preside over some other capital-destroying activity. <laughs> but the mining industry needs to regain the trust of uh, investors. They need to be more efficient rather than just grow. When you start to see companies that are being operated efficiently start to generate blowout margins, uh, then you will see the mining sector as a whole uh, come out ahead. I I'm seeing glimmers of hope now in the junior mining sector. Uh, I'm seeing companies like G-Mining, uh, like Reunion Gold, people who have made good discoveries and are making good progress and are communicating that, but particularly people who are doing it, who have been successful in the past. In other words, I'm starting to see a segregated market among the juniors, where the very high quality juniors do well, sometimes very well. Uh, but the length and breadth of the junior industry hasn't done anything at all. And it doesn't, it doesn't deserve to do anything at all. Steve, if I can leave your listeners with one thing, it's this. If you buy the sector, over two decades, you will go broke. B-R-O-K-E. 
if you buy individual companies, if you buy that 5% of the companies whose performance is so extraordinary that it adds, it, it adds legitimacy to a sector which has performed dismally, you will make a lot of money. The gold and silver mining equities business has been a very good business to me. That is to say that I haven't suffered some losses. I have. But on balance, I've made an awful lot of money. But I haven't made it investing in the sector. I've made it investing in people and investing in companies that were two standard deviations better than the mob. And that's what your listeners are going to have to learn how to do. If you do that <laughs> for two or three years in every decade, you get rewarded extravagantly. When we see a gold bull market, assuming that you're smart enough to trade the market, which most people aren't, uh, you see 300% gains and you see 400% gains. Uh, in the odd alphabet, uh, you see 1,500% gains, 2,000% gains. What's important is to remember the old movie, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and learn yourself and discipline yourself to focus on the good and to avoid the bad and the ugly. That's the whole game in the sector. The operations are swimming. Uh, you know, separate and apart from all the accounting BS, what's really instructive about Silvercrest uh, is cash at beginning of period, cash at end of period, debt at beginning of period, debt at end of period. That's really proof that the operation is generating cash. That's important to see. What I want to see now is the reserve reconciliation. The reserve reconciliation between the feasibility study uh, and the mine plan was stark. It was truly ugly. Uh, what they said was that their model didn't have enough data to support what was in the reserve study. Uh, they have allegedly been doing a lot of infill drilling, and I want to see how much of that material now re-reports to ore, if any. From a cash flow basis, this company is performing extremely well. What I want to know is how long that cash flow lasts, and that's a function <laughs> uh, of reserves. I, I know this CEO, and I had trusted him. My fear, and by the way, this is a pure fear. There's no documentation of this. My fear is that uh, Endeavor may have had to acquire assets in Africa in a way that would be described as traditional, which is to say <laughs> undisclosed compensation. Uh, and this diversion of cash to the CEO may have been in anticipation of just that type of payment. Uh, if people look more carefully uh, at the acquisition of assets uh, by Endeavor uh, in the form of forensic audits, uh, I my spider sense tells me I need to be nervous about that. Okay. All right. Endeavor, Endeavor is, uh, in terms of their ability to discover and build and operate mines in hostile environments, uh, unparalleled. They are truly excellent at it. I'm nervous about uh, the way that they may have exercised their evident political skill in West Africa and whether or not, as a consequence of the termination of the CEO for these payments, uh, a forensic audit uh, in West Africa, even a forensic audit in terms of creating problems which the company would then have to bribe their way out of. <laughs> uh, I, I'm very nervous about that whole process. Amidst the prevailing challenges, Rule discerns glimmers of hope within the junior mining sector. He cites examples of companies such as G Mining and Reunion Gold that have distinguished themselves through notable discoveries and commendable progress. Crucially, Rule emphasizes the importance of backing proven management teams with a track record of success, noting that excellence tends to beget success even in a struggling sector. However, Rule cautions against painting the entire junior mining landscape with the same brush, stressing the need for discernment in selecting investments. He warns that indiscriminate bets on the sector as a whole can spell financial ruin, advocating instead for a targeted approach focused on identifying the top-tier performers capable of delivering outsized returns. The, the spot price market is very liquid. Uh, it, one could argue, given the trading volume of spot, that SPUD is actually a more reflective 
than spot, which is to say the spot market probably ought to be renamed the sprot market uh, because the spot market itself has become highly illiquid. For one thing, more trades are taking place in the term market, which is important. From the other thing, the liquidity isn't there in the spot, in the spot market precisely because Sprott bought 50 million pounds of uranium. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's one important characteristic. It is, uh, I think, increasingly important for uranium equity investors to understand that the spot market is becoming less and less relevant. And what's becoming more and more relevant is the term market. Like you, I'm delighted to see hate mail around the uranium trade. What that means is that the second part of the bull market will be more attainable, which is to say cheaper for more people. But the thing I had to say about the term market uh, probably requires more discussion, if you might permit me that time. Of course. Uh, the term market is a facility where uh, producer and consumers can get together and lock in specified uh, quantities of material over five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever the contract is, that has at least a reference point, a minimum, a, a minimum price with a maximum price that's established by various criteria. This is important, particularly for the producers, because unlike any other mined commodity that I know of, you have price certainty around volume for a substantial period of time. Uh, in every other commodity that I know about, with the exception of the futures market, which generally has a two-year fuse, producers have no idea what they're going to sell their product for. In the uranium business, a producer can lock in a minimum price for a specified quantity of material for up to 15 years in duration. This means, as an example, if the uh, counterparty uh, on the term contract is an investment grade counterparty, that in effect, you have an instrument that you can take to the bank. Throughout the discussion, Rule offers insightful analyzes of specific companies, shedding light on their operational performance and underlying risks. From highlighting the cash flow resilience of Silvercrest to expressing concerns about potential governance issues at Endeavor Mining, Rule provides viewers with a nuanced understanding of the opportunities and pitfalls within the mining sector. Moreover, Rule delves into the evolving dynamics of the uranium market, elucidating the shift towards term contracts as a mechanism for securing price certainty and bolstering investor confidence. He underscores the significance of transparency in contract disclosures, predicting that companies willing to provide greater visibility into their term contracts will reap rewards in terms of enhanced shareholder value. You can show the bank that you can not only produce uranium, but you can sell it for a specified price. This gives the bank much more certainty that you're going to pay back the loan, which should lower your cost of capital. This also makes it much easier for equity analysts like myself to do free cash flow forecasts in the, for, in the future years because you understand something about the selling price that they're going to receive for their commodity. To the extent that you see a substantial amount of the uranium trade move from the spot market to the term market, what you're going to see is price certainty in uranium that is better than it is in any other mined commodity. With the uranium market, as I've said on your show before, the easy money has been made. It was that move from $20 a pound to $100 a pound and the moves in the stocks from hated to tolerated and then to be of interest. The sure money is what's ahead of us. The ability of the Chemicos, the Kazatom Proms, the Next Gens, uh, the companies like that to lock in uh, sales volumes for a long period of time with counterparties like Ontario Power, China General Nuclear, the Southern companies, Duke Power. This is something that we haven't seen in any other commodity at any other point in time in history. The it, it, It's going to take us two or three years to learn how to do this because these term contracts are opaque. The companies don't disclose any more than they absolutely have to for competitive purposes. They don't want to do that. So what you have to do, what I had to do with Cameco last quarter, was look back at total pounds sold, uh, total <laughs> total price received. In other words, I had to sort of reconstruct the difference between the term price, the purchase price, uh, and the spot price of uranium. What I think is going to happen, Steve, over the next three years, 
is that the companies that are more forthcoming with information will have higher share prices at a lower cost of capital because of the certainty of their revenues in the out years. And I think that the market is going to force, particularly the smaller companies, to make fairly explicit disclosures uh, around the contents of their term uh, contracts. And I think this is going to do a wonderful thing for the share prices of 10 or 12 viable uranium juniors. Thank you.